welcome to the Kernel of Knowledge, an expert speaker webinar series brought to you by the Network of the National Library of Medicine, Greater Midwest Region, located at the University of Iowa. My name is Darlene Kasky, All of Us Community Engagement Coordinator and host for today's program. A few housekeeping items. Today's program is being recorded for future viewing and closed caption is available to you. Just click on the CC icon you see at the bottom of the screen. And you are muted on, upon entry, but please know we value your participation, so please use the chat feature to share your comments and ask your questions to all the panelists and attendees throughout today's program. Today's webinar is being brought to you by Rush University Medical Center, a member of the Illinois Precision Medicine Consortium, and all of us at NIH Precision Medicine Research Program. The Alzheimer's Disease Center at Rush is one of 29 Alzheimer's centers in the U.S. designated and funded by the National Institute of Aging. They're committed to discovering better ways to diagnose, treat, and prevent Alzheimer's and other dementias. Our speakers are clinical research assistants of the All of Us Research Program at the Rush Alzheimer's Disease Center. Elizabeth Franco has her bachelor's and master's degrees in economics from the National Autonomous University of Mexico, and she specializes in immigration issues. Sophie Sapura received her bachelor's degree in biomedical visualization from the Rochester Institute of Technology. The coronavirus pandemic has had a widespread, profound effect on our society as a whole, but certain population groups are further tasked with social isolation and loneliness. This presentation raises awareness of the mental and emotional effects during these unusual times and offers evidence-based health information to help adults cope. Elizabeth and Sophie, welcome. I'm gonna turn the program over to you. Thank you so much for having us today here. Sophie? Thank you. And I will start uh, sharing my screen. Okay, thank you. <laughs> thank you again. All right, um, hi everyone. I hope you can see the screen. Please don't hesitate to let us know otherwise. Uh, but thank you so much for joining us today. My name is Sophie Sipora and I am here today with my colleague, Elizabeth Franco, and we are both clinical research assistants for the Rush Alzheimer's Disease Center at the Rush University Medical Center here in Chicago. Uh, next slide, please. And we are so thankful to be here with you all today um, for this opportunity to not only be able to contribute to the Kernel of Knowledge series, but for the chance to shine a light on that of mental health awareness, especially during these very unusual times as we continue coping with the coronavirus pandemic. Uh, next slide, please. And now before we begin, I wanted to quickly touch on some of the things we'll be going over during this presentation, such as the effects of this pandemic, the groups that have been most affected and how. And we will be encouraging discussion as we do want to give everyone a chance to share your voice. And please feel free to do this as we go along um, using the chat box to your side. Um, and we will be taking questions at the end, of course. And I mean, this pandemic has been affecting everyone so uniquely, and its reach has extended so far beyond its physical effects. So we would really appreciate hearing from you, whether it be thoughts, questions, or um, simply sharing your experiences briefly. And we will also go over some of the ways that we can stay engaged and different wellness 
strategy to support our mental and physical well-being during this time. And for those interested, we do have some resources available that we will go over. And lastly, we will be circling back to the importance of medical research during this time and that of the All of Us research program and its role in aiding the efforts in the fight against the coronavirus disease. Uh, next slide, please. Thank you. And so in terms of objectives, this afternoon, our goal is to first raise awareness, open up the conversation about mental health during times of stress, fear, such as by discussing the mental and emotional effects um, of this pandemic, to address the groups being particularly affected. And as I mentioned, uh, to encourage our audience to share their own experiences and to highlight the importance of research during this time, especially. Thank you. Uh, so now when we look back through history, large scale disasters, whether traumatic, such as the 9-11 World Trade Center attacks and the SARS epidemic, or natural disasters, such as Hurricane Ike in 2008, and now those are the latest wildfires that have been devastating parts of California. These types of large scale events and the way that they've been affecting the country and the world, they, there's almost always been, they have almost always been accompanied by increases in psychological distress, such as anxiety, depression, or post traumatic stress disorder. And it's been said that for, for such events, um, the impact on mental health can occur in the immediate aftermath and then persist over long periods of time. Now, according to a recent article by the Journal of the American Medical Association, a similar effect is highly likely and has already been seen with how the coronavirus has spread across the world since its first appearance in December 2019. And we've now all seen the global extraordinary efforts since then to institute the practice of physical distancing or social distancing all over the world, which has resulted in national shutdowns that suddenly change our usual day-to-day -day functioning and behavioral patterns as well. And while these steps have been so crucial to mitigating the spread of the disease, we can imagine how they're very likely to have consequences on our emotional, mental, and, and ultimately physical, physical well-being in both the short and long term. Uh, next slide, please. Thank you. And during these unprecedented times, as we continue learning about the coronavirus um, and as response plans have continued being implemented, we've seen such a wide range of constantly shifting emotions and reactions. The pandemic has brought so many changes to how we live our lives, uncertainty, altered daily routines, and especially social isolation. Many of you may now feel anxiety nowadays, for instance, um, upon seeing headlines on the news, accompanied, accompanied with feelings of worry or dread or panic. And of course, there's the constant heightened importance and reminders of uh, washing your hands, uh, washing underneath your fingernails or sanitizing doorknobs um, and every other surface area in your home and washing over and around your grocery store bags. With this, so many of us may have experienced a sense of hypervigilance and increased paranoia and fear over our health and potentially being affected. And these feelings of fear, uncertainty, loneliness, and perhaps especially loss are shared by so many people. And the thing we all have to remember is that it's okay not to be okay during times like this, especially. And our anxiety while uncomfortable is in a sense helping us to cope, to bind us together even from a physical distance and to slow the spread of the coronavirus. Uh, next slide, please. Thank you. All right, so I wanted to take a quick moment and hear from some of you in the chat box to your side and just do a brief check-in, if you will. What have been some thoughts 
or feelings that you might have experienced recently. And this doesn't have to necessarily be negative or positive. It can be just one worded, short answers if you would like. So I'll give you all a moment. So we have fear, isolation, sadness, anger about anger, irritation, anxiety about the basic rules of the economy. Yes, heights and anxiety. Yes. Absolutely. So thank you all so much for taking a moment to share. Yes, these are absolutely being felt by so many, as you can all see, and my, myself including. Um, but so just jumping back into it, if you wouldn't mind going to the next slide, Elizabeth. Thank you. As I previously mentioned, it's been anticipated that with a large scale disaster, such as the coronavirus disease of 2019, or COVID-19, as we now have all by now been commonly referring to it as, we are likely to continue seeing an increase in emotional, mental distress. And by April 2020, for instance, Americans were not only reporting more symptoms and signs of depression, anxiety, and fear more than ever before, but the incidence of those symptoms were being reported as being higher than historic norms. So in one survey conducted by Healthline, as you can see here, 49% uh, of respondents were expressing concerns for their health due to COVID-19 and were showing signs of anxiety, depression, all those other psychiatric conditions ranging from mild to severe. Now, based on current research, the effects of the fear may not be felt equally in all groups. For women, for instance, who are usually found to suffer anxiety a bit more so than men, women have reported more concerns about their health than men. And then there are those who have underlying health conditions that have also been reporting higher rates of fear and anxiety due to those concerns over their heightened vulnerability to the virus. And next slide, please. Thank you. Now, though the pandemic has been affecting people all over the world, I do want to touch a little bit more on how it may be affecting certain groups more than others. Uh, these stories of how our frontline healthcare workers have been impacted during this time is one example that may be fam very familiar to many of you. Even before COVID-19, uh, working in healthcare could already be, be very stressful, as many of you may be able to vouch for it. And research on mental distress in healthcare workers had already shown that compared to other industries, healthcare workers were more likely to experience burnout or suffer certain psychiatric disorders. Um, and when it comes to mental and physical exhaustion in the healthcare field, due to perhaps extended work shifts or higher workloads, these professionals, this is not unfamiliar for those professionals, uh, but what has been unfamiliar is the nature of the risk of infection that they now face at work and feelings of helplessness, um, such as through the lack of resources or the constant being feeling that you're unable to help those who might be in pain or who are afraid. So you can imagine how the pandemic has been exacerbating work-related stress amongst certain healthcare professionals. And while healthcare professionals are often resilient, they are human and they do need the same psychological support that so many others do, especially during times like this. And during COVID-19, our definition of essential workers has also been expanded to include those in the food service industry, such as grocery store clerks, restaurant staff, bus drivers, manufacturers, all of whom have been working so hard to provide essential services and goods while maintaining safe environments. And it could be said that our healthcare and essential service workers are similarly confronted daily with the unsettling reality that they themselves are regularly exposed to a potentially lethal culprit, which is in the form of the COVID virus and are therefore at risk for spreading the virus to their own families. So burnout rate, increased anxiety, insomnia, depression, as you can see here, these are only some of the effects that have been reported. 
So members of these groups have been truly heroic as they continue to work through so many of the physical and mental effects that this pandemic has already been found to have on them. Of the essential service workers, it's also important to recognize that many of those individuals may be making minimum wage and therefore be in positions where they're having to choose between their health and the need to earn wages to pay for basic necessities. And compared to those of us who kind of stay home to avoid the risk of returning to work and potentially being exposed, many essential workers cannot avoid those risks. So this is an additional mental and financial stress. And for those with pre-existing health conditions, many have also reported feeling significantly more isolated as there's usually a greater need for them to take social distancing precautions due to their increased physical vulnerabilities and increased risk. And for those in our minority communities who for generations have already been struggling under health differences from systemic health and social inequalities, the conditions of a public health emergency such as COVID-19 has been especially isolating for this group, isolating them from the resources that they may need to prepare for and respond to outbreaks. Uh, next slide, please. Thank you. All right. So throughout uh, the past public health emergencies, severe illness and death rates have been found to be much higher for racial and ethnic minority populations than for others. And this has already been seen during this pandemic with death rates amongst Black Americans currently being 97.9 deaths per 100,000 people and with the Hispanic death rate being at 74.3 deaths per 100,000 people, both of which are obviously much higher than those of white or Asian individuals, as you can see here. And I briefly previously mentioned how health differences between racial and ethnic groups result from longstanding inequities in living and working and health and social conditions and how this has been isolating for these individuals and it has isolated them from the resources that they need in order to live during this pandemic. And for many of these groups, poor living conditions make it, for, for example, can negatively contribute to health conditions and ultimately make it that much harder for them to take precautions and protect themselves against COVID-19 or to seek care if they do get sick. So, uh, next slide, please. Thank you. And for those who are immunocompromised or with serious underlying medical conditions, such as diabetes or heart disease or lung disease, taking precautions against COVID-19 has been especially crucial due to their vulnerability and increased risk of getting severely ill from COVID-19. In fact, four in 10 adults ages 18 and older in the United States, which averages, I believe, up to 92.6 million people, have been found to have a higher risk of developing more serious complications from COVID-19. There's therefore not only a increased need for these groups to practice social distancing, but these individuals are more likely to also face disruptions in treatment for their condition due to the continuously overwhelmed state of our current health systems and hospitals. Our next slide, please. All right. Now, we must consider how we as human beings are, ha are hardwired to be social creatures, thriving best when we can give and receive support from one another. Social connections, which can help boost our, our mood and benefit of physical health, and in cases like today's reality, can aid in positive coping. So when you consider the social isolation from limited interactions during this pandemic, which we've all been experiencing in our own ways, the restrictions on social contact and the resulting loneliness and uncertainty may altogether make it even more difficult for those of our older adults with 
health condition who previously were perhaps relying on regular visits with their family and friends and health care providers, um, who all of whom were, were normally providing their comfort and support that we consider so crucial for healthy aging and overall physical well-being. And so as COVID-19 cases have continued increasing globally, the well-being of our older adult groups warrant more urgent attention now more than ever, not just in terms of potential physical vulnerability, but with how the periods of isolations have been mentally impacting these individuals, despite how crucial the social distancing measures have been to prevention and spread during this time. So, my next slide. Thank you. All right, so as we look at the ways that we can better care for our older adults, this pandemic has so far brought to light certain vulnerabilities for this particular group. Uh, frailty, for instance, has been linked to a higher risk of death and longer time spent in the hospital. Given that frailty is signified by a loss of energy and bodily reserves, it can leave us more vulnerable to sudden changes and eventually can affect recovery. And social distancing might also not always be possible, given the in-person full contact care required for certain older, older individuals. And this also applies to the next point where older adults who have certain sensory issues may also be more at risk of infection, um, as seen with those who have trouble understanding information or practicing certain preventative measures such as the hand washing or the social distancing. And that may be due to um, cog certain cognitive conditions, or there are those who may have limited mobility and can't easily avoid coming into close contact with others who may be infected. And there's also the fact that social isolation and loneliness have been heavily linked to higher risk for conditions, such as anxiety, weakened immune systems, high blood pressure, which could in turn further exacerbate the risk for those people. And lastly, I wanted to bring up the significance of providing support for our older adults as they experience grief, especially during this time, whether it be due to loss or adjusting to the distancing from their loved ones. And when you think about it, one of the most time-tested ways of coping with grief is through social connection, to be with others where we can, in a way that we can hold your loved one's hand or have meaningful conversations, things that all together can soften the blow of a loss. And in the age of COVID-19, today's need for physical distancing has driven such a wedge in those moments of connection where so many of us, but especially those of older adults, may be having to cope with grief and sorrow alone being socially isolated and not getting that physical comfort that we need from family and friends. Um, and yet with this unusual kind of loneliness, for many of us, it has meant getting a bit more creative when it comes to connecting socially. In my family, for instance, uh, we have been trying to figure out how to safely visit and continue to see my husband's grandmother. Not her home, but through the window of the memory care facility that she lives in which had closed their doors back in March when the pandemic first began and they had closed their doors to visitors as a safety measure. And during these window visits, uh, we had to first figure out how to make it so that we could all hear each other, which ended up being through a phone. And since then, almost every day, we would walk up to her window and she would be there already waiting, her phone in her hand, so excited to tell us about her latest activities and all about our day. So for us, even when there's been literal barriers, whether they be windows separating us from hugging each other or the face mask, there's almost always ways that we can still connect, even if we're unable to physically touch during this time. Uh, next slide, please. Thank you. 
And so I wanted to also quickly share this chart just to give a better sense of, again, how crucial it is that we support our older adults during this pandemic. As you can see here, more hospitalizations and fatalities have been seen for those older than 65. And it's not just about the physical pre-existing vulnerabilities or underlying conditions. We have to look at how the common sources of stress for everyone during this pandemic has been the drop in meaningful activities, stimulation, social engagement. So we have to consider the connection between social relationships and our health. Not only can being isolated from others trigger those such as anxiety and depression, um, but when we add the building impact of that loneliness to the worries of the unknown that we've all been sharing during this pandemic and the uncertainty, the uncertainty that we've all been sharing, we're layering on so many additional stresses that could eventually only worsen our physical and mental health. And as troubling as these times have been, and as daunting as it may seem to, this is why it's more important than ever to stay connected as best as we can and reach out for support when we need it. And with that, I would like to introduce my lovely colleague, Elizabeth, who will walk us through the discussion for wellness and staying connected during COVID-19. Thank you so much, Sophie. It is a great presentation. Thank you. Well, I will continue talking about the other points left. And the first one is to encourage the audience to share their own experiences. So please feel free to type on the chat your questions, comments, and also some of your uh, experiences during these difficult times. Also, I will be talking about some ways to stay engaged about wellness, and finally, about how important is research right now, and specifically about the All of Us Research Program. Uh, so there are so many ways to stay connected with friends and family while keeping yourself and your loved ones safe. We can join or host some virtual visits with friends and family, and for those who have the internet, this is a very useful tool to use. And it has so many friendly platforms like Zoom, FaceTime, and Skype. But also for those who like uh, to be playing games, there are a community on the internet that you can find of game lovers. But those are not the only activities that you can join. You can take a, a virtual tour of museums around the world. Maybe in the past, you had the desire to travel to another city or another country, but now you can do it from your house virtually. So this is a very good opportunity for you to use the internet. Also, you can attend some virtual music concerts or join an online discussion group or book club, or even activities like this one that is so useful and informative. Or finally, another activity, it could be to be writing a letter. When we, wrote a, when we write a letter, we can express our emotions and it could be a relief activity. So I encourage everyone to do this kind of activities. Um, now I would like to hear from you. So if you can type on the chat, what are some other ways that you have been staying socially connected with loved ones while practicing social distancing? So please feel free to type on the chat and Sophie can help us to read some of your comments. Thank you so much for taking the time to, to type. Sophie, would you like to read some of the comments? Yes, absolutely. I was giving everyone a, a moment. Mm -hmm. And so far we have some, oh, we have some great ideas. We have some people writing cards, um, having telephone calls, which yes, absolutely. Uh, there's letter writings, um, taking photos of their gardens, including them in their letters, which 
I would love one of those. <laughs> and mail care packages, that's a great idea. Zoom parties, that sounds fun. Phone call from your front porch. Zoom dinner parties, yes. Okay, well, thank you so much for taking the time, everyone, to type on the chat. And thank you, Sophie. So I will continue talking about wellness. Wellness is the state of being in good health, mentally and physically talking. So I will give you six tips that you can use to stay healthy. So the first one, it is to get active. It could be possible that when you think about somebody doing exercise, you can imagine that person going to the gym every day or running in a marathon or with big muscles. But that's not necessarily true for everyone because every one of us is different. So the kind of activities that we can do will be, of course, different as well. Uh, for example, if you like to dance, just play your favorite music and move your body to the rim of the music. If you like flowers, gardening is a very good option for you. And also some activities like arts and crafts. But remember, the more you move, the more your body will be able to fight inflammation and infection diseases. As Aunt Sophie mentioned before, to stay connected with our loved ones is so important right now. So we, sh we will not be feeling isolated. And now that it's difficult to go out and eat in a restaurant or to buy fast food, it is a good opportunity to observe the food that we are eating every day. And diet rich in fruits, vegetables, help our immune system to be strong and it protects our body to the harmful viruses and bacteria that cause illnesses. And I know that you hear this all the time, but I will mention it anyways. Wash your hands, avoid touching your nose, your face, your mouth with your hands without washing them before for at least 20 seconds with soap and water. This is so important right now. I also try to learn how to manage stress, how you can increase your physical activity, get plenty of sleep, and also stay positive. Um, and also it is so important that you can use the internet. You can find some videos of yoga exercises, meditation, or relaxing sounds and avoid people who are sick. If you cannot do so, and if, if you are an older adult, it is so important that you protect yourself by wearing a face mask. And if you are caring of somebody with the flu, wear a face mask, gloves, and wash your hands frequently. And remember, we all are together in this. Now I would like to play a short video about dealing with anxiety and mental health during this pandemic situation. It lasts just two minutes or so, so I, will, I hope you like it. Coronavirus can stir up all sorts of feelings like fear, anxiety or stress. A little stress can be helpful. It can be the motivator that keeps us self-isolating or washing our hands. But constant or high levels of stress can negatively affect our mental and physical health. Taking care of our minds is always important, but doing so in the middle of a pandemic can be really tricky. Here are some tips and techniques to help us all get through this. Start your day well. It can be tempting to reach for your phone or switch on the news first thing in the morning. But starting the day with a simple mindfulness exercise, such as notice three things, can help you check in with how you're feeling and to connect with your environment. Mindfulness is well known to make people feel calmer and cope better with stress. This quick exercise takes less than a minute. Before you get out of bed, pause and concentrate on three things you can see. For example, your patterned curtains, the blue sky, or even just a light bulb. 
Then listen for three things you can hear. The sound of cars passing by, a singing bird, or the hum of your boiler. And finally, notice three things you can feel in contact with your body. Your PJs, bed sheets, or even your cat. Get planning. Although it's tempting to stay curled up in bed, adapting and creating positive new routines can be helpful and keep you motivated. For example, in the place of what was your morning commute or a school run, listen to a podcast or go for a walk. Incorporating some form of exercise outdoors if possible into every day is good for mental and physical well-being. And set aside time to speak to friends, family or work colleagues every day. Connecting with others releases feel-good hormones that help to relieve stress. Stay informed, not overloaded. Although we are able to cope with some stress here and there, being constantly exposed to a rolling, fear-inducing newsfeed can impact your mental health. Hearing upsetting or anxiety-provoking news triggers a stress response in our bodies. Keeping informed is important, but managing your social media and information intake will make a big difference to how you feel. Try to limit the time you spend listening to, watching or reading things about the outbreak. Turn to one or two reliable sources for news and check them just once or twice a day to stay informed. If feelings of anxiety spring up in your day, try a breathing technique such as box breathing. Concentrating on and controlling your breathing is a scientifically backed way of making you feel calm. Box breathing is quick, easy and can be done anywhere. Breathe in deeply through your nose for a count of four. Hold your breath for four. Breathe out completely through your mouth for a count of four. And hold your empty breath for four. Then repeat four times. Getting ready for bed. Good quality sleep makes a big difference to how you feel, but feeling worried or anxious can make getting to sleep difficult. You could set a coronavirus news curfew so you don't watch or read anything to do with the outbreak after 7pm and aim for a regular bedtime. You might also find it helpful to avoid caffeine before bed, not eat or drink too much late in the evening, have a warm bath and keep screens out of your bedroom. If getting to sleep is proving tricky, you can try the body scan. This simple exercise helps you to relax both your mind and body, and with practice you might find that it even sends you off to sleep. Whilst you're lying in bed or resting, take your attention to your feet. Relax and soften them into the bed as much as possible, then scan up your body, moving to your ankles. Release any tension and soften them into the bed. Once they feel relaxed, move up further to your calves, then knees, thighs, and so on. Keep moving slowly up your body, all the way to your head, softening and relaxing every muscle along the way. We hope these simple daily steps will help. Take care. Thank you. Um, for those who are dealing with feelings such as anxiety, depression, here is a list of resources that you can refer to. Um, I can always come back at the end of this presentation so you can write down these numbers or I can copy and paste on the chat at the end so every one of you can have access to this. But remember, you are not alone, okay? And finally, I would like to talk about the All of Us Research Program. Um, right now, research is so important to all the things that are going on around the country and around the world. And the All of Us Research Program is a national initiative where the overall goal of the program is to help researchers understand why some people get sick and others remain healthy. It is very easy to participate and the first step is to create an account online at www.joinallofus.org. At the end of the presentation, you can also find the website. Right now, we have around 350,000 participants around the country, but it's important to say that 
all the participants are also our partners. And that's why for us, every one of our participants is so important. And every one of the participants can have access to the late discoveries of this research program. So um, we have participants from different parts of the country, different parts of the world. We have participants from different backgrounds and different social economics. So all of you are welcome to join and all of us together can make a change. Uh, in regards to the coronavirus pandemic, the All of Us Research Program had additional surveys who were designed for both participants who had been infected with the coronavirus and those who have not. And also they had some questions about symptoms, stress, social distancing, and economic impact. This is very important because with all the data collection that we collect, um, the researchers are studying over time how and why this coronavirus is affecting people differently. And again, research is so important. You can make a difference joining a program like this that is so inclusive. Now, finally, we would like to hear from you. We would like to know what would you like to know more about it? Uh, was anything that it surprised you? Or what did you find more interesting about this presentation? All of us are learning together. So please type on the chat and we can learn about this all together. Um, so this is our contact information in case you want to uh, take note of this. And I will also copy and paste the resource list that I just mentioned before, okay? Thank you. So now the space is open for questions. While people are writing their questions in the chat box, and please um, address your questions to all panelists and attendees so everybody can read. I would like, to, I'll start with one question I have. I recently put, um, I put, um, we moved an aunt, a great aunt, 90 years old, into an assisted living home. And within two months, uh, they had to close the to the public for the safety of the residents. And fortunately, we were able to do Zoom calls with her. The, the assisted living, living place had never dealt with iPads before, but they got an iPad and they, they're they very warm and welcoming of letting us call in and have conversations with my aunt. I have noticed her dementia has worsened during this period of time. So I'm curious to know whether that is just, it would have, her dementia would have increased regardless, or if it maybe is related somewhat to social isolation um, and not having regular visitors. And I'm wondering if there's any studies on that. Um, I can kind of attest to this. I, of course, would love to find out more on that as well, um, because obviously I'm not a professional in dementia care myself, but I do, from, from what we have studied so far, it does seem that at least there is a connection between the isolation um, potentially ex exacerbating certain symptoms, whether that be um, dementia itself or exacerbating things that were already there. Um, but I can absolutely find out some more on that. Thank you. Thank you. That's a really good question. Yes, it is. I just copy and paste on the chat the list of resources uh, that were in the presentation. Okay, we are just receiving um, some comments. Thank you for the presentation. Thank you, everyone, who joined us today in this in this presentation. Okay, so before everybody leaves, I would like to share some housekeeping items. I know that some of you have come to get an MLA CE credit. So bear with me while I share my screen again. Thank you, Elizabeth and Sophie. It was a wonderful presentation. 
Um, I think everybody is dealing with this either personally. I mean, everybody is dealing with it personally and professionally. And you touched on so many um, issues about uh, people in the front line and how everybody is experiencing this in different ways and shapes. So thank you for your information and insights. And again, we want to acknowledge the All of Us Research Program. As they mentioned, it's a mission of all of us to accelerate health research and medical breakthroughs, enabling individualized prevention, treatment, and care for all of us. And we welcome you to learn more by visiting joinallofus.org slash NLM. And now, if you will take a minute to fill out our quick participant survey, and I will put the survey, uh, the link in the chat box. Um, let me get there for a second. I'll put this link in our chat box. It is. Get this out of the way for you. And will it let me type? HTTPS backslash m.gov. Okay, thank you. Please take this um, small, short participant survey. And we, if you are wanting to receive a one hour of MLAC credit, you will receive a follow-up email um, with that information to obtain the code. So if you did register for this event, you, we will follow up with an, uh, with an email with that code. Also, very important, if you did enjoy today's presentation and you would like to make this a virtual program available to your community, you are welcome to contact Elizabeth and Sophie. They put their emails in the chat box. Please know that they can offer this presentation in Spanish, too. So let's say you are a public library and you would like to offer this program as a virtual presentation, please reach out to them. That is all we have. So thank you. Elizabeth, Sophie, once again, and thank all of you for joining us today. That thank concludes. you so much. You're welcome. This concludes our Kernel of Knowledge webinar. Thank you all so much. Thanks for watching. This video was produced by the Network of the National Library of Medicine. Select the circular channel icon to subscribe to our channel, or select a video thumbnail to watch another video from the channel.